welcome to this week's episode of Around Kansas. I'm Michelle Martin, your co-host. Deb is off this week recovering after two extremely busy weeks, including uh, the wrap-up filming for The Contested Plains and a successful event at the Fort Wallace Museum. Deb will be back next week. So today in our history segment, continuing to honor the history of women in Kansas, I wanna talk about three very unlikely political heroines in Kansas history. And the first is Susanna Medora Salter. Susanna Medora Salter was born in Ohio and moved to Kansas with her family. And while uh, in Kansas, she uh, attended college and actually earned a law degree from Kansas State University. While there, she met and married and she and her husband moved to the little town of Argonia, Kansas. And Argonia is in South Central Kansas, is a very small, sleepy community. It was settled by a lot of Quakers. As a matter of fact, um, Susanna's family, um, her parents, they were Quakers themselves. And her father, Oliver, would end up serving as the first mayor of Argonia and her husband as the first city clerk. So what's very interesting, um, in the mid 1880s, women in Kansas were gaining different forms of um, political voice and power through the ballot box. Initially, we had the ability to vote in school board elections that came in 1861. But then of course, in the mid 1880s, women are given the ability to vote in municipal and city elections in Kansas um, on that path to full enfranchisement at the ballot box. So in Argonia, as in many Kansas cities in the 19th century, we had a bit of a battle brewing between the wet faction and the dry faction. And for those of you up on your history of Kansas, the wet and dry factions were those who either opposed the Women's Christian Temperance Union or supported it. So in um, Argonia in particular, many of the women were actively involved in the Women's Christian Temperance Union and were vocally supporting male candidates for city offices who were going to support dry legislation. Well, the men in Argonia decided in 1887 as a joke and as a way to possibly curb the influence of the WCTU in their town they would nominate a woman from the WCTU to be to run for mayor. So they put Susanna Medora Salter's name on the ballot. Now, folks, right here, the first mistake the gentleman made was one, putting a woman who was an attorney on the ballot, and two, putting a woman attorney who said if she was elected, she would serve on the ballot. Well, the men thought this would be a funny joke. They thought Susanna might get 10, 15, 20 votes at most. It would put egg on the face of the WCTU and the wet versus dry battle would be over. Well, the women of the WCTU and Susanna Medora Salter got the last laugh. And in April of 1867, Susanna Medora Salter was elected the first female mayor in the United States of America. Now, Let's fast forward one year, 1888, and what community would elect women once again over this wet versus dry battle? Oskaloosa, Kansas. And Oskaloosa went one step further. Not only did they elect Mary D. Lohman as mayor, they also elected women to serve on the city council. There were so many women on the city council that newspaper editors across the state in the country said that the town should rename itself to Oskaloosa since it was all run by women. And of course, Lucy is a woman's name. So we've got the women of Oskaloosa moving to the forefront and serving in civic offices. And not to be outdone, Cottonwood Falls, Kansas. Yes, Cottonwood Falls in the heart of the Flint Hills also elected a female mayor and an entire female city council and 
a female judge that oversaw policing. It's interesting to note in 1888, 1889, when those women were elected, of course, there was immediate pushback. Uh, newspaper editors said that the women should go ahead and pass ordinances about uh, the best jelly recipes. Um, they should go ahead and pass legislation in the communities to mandate control of men's leisure activities. Or they should go ahead and pass ordinances on the best methods to hem a skirt. What people didn't count on, however, was the women, not only Susanna Medora Salter, but the women in Oskaloosa and the women in, in uh, Cottonwood Falls rising to the occasion. The women in Cottonwood Falls were said to have been the cleanest, most upright and honest city administration up to that point in time in the community's history. And on top of that, they said that the courts were run with respect, dignity, and decorum. So gentlemen, the next time you wanna play a joke on Kansas women, don't underestimate our strength and our ability to get the vote. So if you didn't know about some pathbreaking women in Kansas history and politics, now you know a little more about Susanna Medora Salter. You can actually look in our archives online on YouTube. I did a full uh, segment on Susanna Medora Salter. You can also take a look online and learn more about Oscar Lucy's petticoat government and the women who capably ran the city of Cottonwood Falls. We'll provide you more links uh, in uh, the posting. We'll be right back with a wildlife segment. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP. That brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. Baxter Black likes to say that cowboy poetry is about wrecks. It's about cattle wrecks and horse wrecks and rodeo wrecks and train wrecks and <laughs> Tyrannosaurus wrecks. It's about the goofy things that seem to happen to cowboys. So this poem is an example. It's called, Oh Dear. His wife had bought a new car for her to drive around, especially for the drive from the ranch to work in town. There was one she really liked that the auto salesman showed. He said, be careful driving at night when the deer are on the road. They finally bought that car and she got behind the wheel of a pretty brand spanking new Chevy sedan automobile. She was pleased with the new car and the joy it would derive. She proudly and carefully parked it in the drive. Then the rancher went to work. He had to move some hay. He'd use the old John Deere to move some bales up the driveway. He had a newer tractor with a fully enclosed cab, which the old one did not have, but the old one's handier to grab. Then the farrier showed up to earn his shoeing bill, so the rancher parked the old John Deere nearby, just up the hill. The rancher caught two horses and tied them by the fence, so the trimming and the shoeing of his horses could commence. The farrier got his nippers to trim off the hooves length and clamped down on the handles with all his usual strength. The hoof trimming flew off, just like it sometimes did, but it smacked the other horse right above his left eyelid. The startled horse commenced to buck and snort and jump and kick and struck a nearby bucket with a very powerful lick. The bucket went a-flying across the evening air right toward the old John Deere, which was still just sitting there. It banged right off the gear shift and fate then took its toll. It knocked it out of gear. The John Deere tractor began to roll. The rancher watched in horror as he viewed this from afar. The tractor rolled downhill right into the new car. It was a direct hit. 
The crash sounded through the night. It brought his wife a running. She could not believe the sight. They surveyed all the damage. The tractor totaled the sedan. He screwed up all his courage and called the insurance man. So what exactly happened? Asked the insurance man in fear. Well, the rancher said, I guess her car got hit by a deer. Happy trails. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're gonna find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. And we've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray Pump Organ Collection. We're a little bee place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. Welcome back to Around Kansas. I'm Michelle Martin, your co-host. Today on our wildlife segment, it is all about spring in Kansas. And if there's one thing I equate with spring in Kansas, it's beautiful scenery like this behind me. This was actually taken on the Red Buffalo Ranch in Chautauqua County outside of Sedan, Kansas. But one thing that I remember about spring in Kansas and I love is, of course, the return of wildlife. And to me, there's no bird that is more quintessentially Kansas than the prairie chicken. We're going to take a look and dip back into the Around Kansas Wildlife Vault and look at prairie chickens. Aerial surveys began a few days ago and continue through mid-May in five states, including Kansas, that contain lesser prairie chicken habitat. The surveys are conducted annually by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to document population trends and the species response to management strategies identified in the Lesser Prairie Chicken Rangewide Conservation Plan. This survey is critical to provide annual estimates of the lesser prairie chicken population across five states, explained Roger Wolf, manager of the program. These population estimates help guide decisions related to conservation efforts targeting lesser prairie chickens and their habitat. The range-wide plan is a collaborative effort of the WAFWA and the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism, as well as state wildlife agencies in Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado. It was developed to ensure the conservation of the lesser prairie chicken with voluntary cooperation of landowners and industry and allows agricultural producers and industry to continue operations while reducing impacts to the bird and its grassland habitat. The surveys will be conducted by helicopter in locations chosen at random within Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. Preliminary results from the 2018 surveys will be available beginning July 1st. Just last fall, the WAFWA finalized permanent conservation agreements with three private landowners to conserve more than 3,500 acres of high-quality Lesser Prairie Chicken Habitat in northwest Kansas. These were the first easements obtained in the shortgrass echo region, and the organization applauded the visionary landowners who are protecting and conserving the landscape as working ranches, ensuring they will be enjoyed by future generations. These easements will protect habitat that benefits a whole host of wildlife species, including the Lesser Prairie Chicken, this is another positive step toward establishing a stronghold for lesser prairie chickens in this area. The complex of properties is located near Smoky Valley Ranch in Logan County, which is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. The nearly 18,000-acre ranch is identified in the range-wide plan as a potential target around which a stronghold for lesser prairie chickens could be established. A stronghold is defined as a block of fairly contiguous grassland consisting of at least 25,000 acres that contains at least six mating areas for the birds. There must also be assurances that all the properties contributing to a stronghold will be protected from future development and managed in a way that is beneficial to lesser prairie chickens into the future. With additional easements, Smoky Valley Ranch and nearby permanently conserved properties 
could become a stronghold for the species. Hundred years of stories take more than a year to share. The Santa Fe Trail Bicentennial continues through 2025. Join us on this epic journey of exploration on America's most historic road. Find our podcast each week on truckersradiousa.com. Find us on Facebook. Find us at santafetrail.org. The Santa Fe Trail lives on. Howdy, I'm Seth Hayes, and welcome to my hometown from then to now. Council Grove has a rich history as deep as the prairie tall grass. Spend the day visiting 25 historic sites or explore the unique shops and restaurants or mosey out of town along the Santa Fe Trail. You all visit my hometown, Council Grove, in the heart of the Flint Hills. Welcome back to Around Kansas. I'm Michelle Martin, your co-host. Deb is getting a week off after a couple of intense weeks. We can't wait for Deb to tell us more about the wrap-up filming for the docudrama, The Contested Plains. And we can't wait to hear a wrap-up of events at Fort Wallace Museum with their uh, spring symposium and their Captain Kehoe's Emerald Banquet. So we will be glad when Deb is back next week. Now behind me is one of my good friends, Captain Tom of the Holmes Brigade. And this photograph I took at Fort Scott National Historic Site. Now that spring is upon us, we are getting back into uh, living history and history event season. So we wanted to share with you today three events that you can take advantage of. Two of them this month in March and one in April. So we're going to start with March. Folks, if you have not met Deb Goodrich, my partner in crime and co-host in person, you have an opportunity on St. Patrick's Day on March 17th at 6.30 in the evening at the historic Ritchie House in Topeka, Kansas. Deb will be uh, giving a lecture that had to be rescheduled due to bad weather. Uh, she will be speaking about the life and career of Captain Miles Kehoe. Uh, she refers to him as Custer's Irish Knight. And uh, ladies, if you're not into military history, just go to look at the pictures of uh, Captain Keogh. He was one handsome man. So, but you can you will learn so much about Keogh and his incredible life uh, in the Central Plains and his connections to Kansas history. So again, go out and uh, visit Deb. She'll be on the road in Topeka, Kansas on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day at 6.30 in the evening at the historic Ritchie House, speaking about Miles Kehoe. Now, you can actually, after that, you could always go ahead and uh, take in some uh, good food and drink in downtown Topeka, so you can uh, take advantage of that for St. Patty's Day. Now, as we get toward the end of the month, and of course, it's still Women's History Month, on Saturday, March 26th, at the Dodge City Public Library, you can meet the one and only Marla Matkin. Marla is a good friend of Deb's and mine. Uh, she is from Hill City, Kansas, and she is a native Kansan. She's an author, a historian, and she is a fantastic living history interpreter. And she is going to take us back 200 years to look at the lives and roles that women played on the historic Santa Fe Trail. So you can uh, learn more with Marla Matkin and her Women on the Santa Fe Trail program. And that is again, Saturday, March 26th at 1.30 in the afternoon at the Dodge City Public Library. And we will provide you a link. And uh, actually we also can provide a copy of the poster along with the link for you to get all the information. Reservations are required for Marla's program, but it is free and open to the public. Now, getting to this gentleman here uh, over my shoulder, my good friend, Captain Tom from the Holmes Brigade. In April, 
Fort Scott National Historic Site will once again come alive with the sound of Civil War soldiers and life and activity in their annual Civil War encampment. And that is actually going to be on April 23rd and 24th this year. It's a little later than normal. So at Fort Scott National Historic Site for the Civil War weekend on April 23rd and 24th, you will see uh, soldiers who are camped. They will be uh, interpreting daily life of soldiers in camp. They'll be showing you marching, uh, drilling, There'll be infantry demonstrations. Um, there'll be artillery demonstrations. There will be cavalry demonstrations. The bakehouse will come alive with the sounds and smells of baking army bread. You will probably be able to stroll around and find some officers' wives and some civilians. So there is something for everyone. The fort does a wonderful job of providing an array of programs, living history demonstrations, and activities on those weekends. So you'll want to go ahead and visit the website for the Fort Scott National Historic Site. That will provide you with more information about this year's Civil War weekend encampment on April 23rd and April 24th. So there are three fantastic opportunities for you to get out, explore Kansas, and learn more about our history. Deb will be back with you next week. Folks, I will be taking a couple of weeks off. I am finishing, um, I'm in the home stretch of finishing my PhD dissertation. I'm actually gearing up for a week of intense editing leading up to my dissertation defense on March 21st. And uh, after that day, when I come back to around Kansas, I'll be Dr. Michelle. So. If you could all send me some of that great sunflower love this direction, I sure would appreciate it. So Deb will be with you for the next two weeks, and then we'll be back together again when spring is hopefully starting to uh, come alive in Kansas to take you on more adventures somewhere around Kansas. Mm -hmm.